my microphone. Okay, 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 okay. Um, we're good? Question mark? Nope. Okay, now, <laughs> now we're good. Hello, hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Hello, I am Fi, the Neutrophil, here again with a totally not scuffed stream, and today we have a very special guest in the house. Special guest. Uh, let me make sure that people can hear you. <laughs> uh, 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 Nep, can you say something real quick? Nep, or Nepenthes, or Nepenthes, depending on how you want to say it. Yes, yes. Uh, would you care to introduce yourself to the audience one more time? Because my mic settings are messed up. <laughs> um, yeah, for sure. Uh, well then, hello, Fi's community. My name is Nap. I am a gardening-themed VTuber, carnivorous plant VTuber. I am based on the hanging pitcher plants of the family Nepenthes. And yeah, I, I, yeah. <laughs> and Hi. I'm a white blood cell, <laughs> and we have teamed up to talk about a plant pathogen called phytoplasma. And so to give everybody here a kind of brief overview of what type of stream this is going to be, this is what's called a journal club stream. And a journal club is what happens when you get a bunch of scientifically oriented people and they work together to kind of read a published paper and they talk about it just like a book club. Um, and so today, what we have for you is the cumulative efforts that we have spent behind the scenes reading and digesting this paper to bring you uh, our understanding of this paper. And so um, for context, I haven't actually had like a plant education since like a decade ago so i'm really excited to share what uh we've learned or at least what i've learned and then nep can share what she's learned uh reading this paper together which by the way you can find linked in the uh, pinned comments so if you want to follow along and maybe try a um try to read it for yourself you are more than welcome to uh okay so Let's get into it. The first thing that I want to do is um, talk a little bit about the agenda for today in terms of the order that we're going to talk about things. And the first thing that I'd like to do is to talk about our respective backgrounds with respect to the topic at hand. So oftentimes people believe scientists to be infallible, uh, that science can do no wrong or get anything wrong. But in reality, it's just a bunch of very passionate people who are each individually capable of getting things wrong. And so to fully appreciate uh, and to get into context, our understanding of the paper, we're just going to share kind of our training and why this paper sits kind of in the middle of our specialties. I'll start. So uh, I am a cell and molecular biologist. Uh, I spent a whole bunch of years in graduate school and I am now an instructor for that topic, more or less. And so my focus has mainly been the immune system, the role of the immune system proteins in the nervous system, which is to say that the realm of plants is very foreign to me. I've picked up pathogen study as kind of a hobby for this YouTube channel. So I'm I'm approaching this paper from the viewpoint of sort of a hobbyist. Uh, Nep, do you want to share your background as well as what this picture is? Yeah, for sure. So um, I am a horticulturalist. I have an undergraduate degree in um, well, I have a bachelor's of science in agriculture, but I specified in horticulture as my major. And I am a practicing horticulturalist as well. I have my agronomy license with a scope of practice in horticulture. Um, this is a license from my province. So I'm Canadian, by the way. My specialty is northern gardening. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about is related to um, more of a Canadian uh, horticultural experience because that is where my knowledge um, is specialized. But yeah, what else? Oh, as a horticulturalist, um, things like plant pathogens, understanding how you manage diseases in a crop, um, recognizing disease symptoms and what they mean for your plant, all of that is really, really horticulturally important. I went over a lot of similar things in school. 
Um, I I find the topic fascinating, but that's that's my background. Oh, and I guess um, I I special not that I've, that's, I've done this in school, but my specialty and my passion is horticultural education. So teaching you guys about gardening and plants and yes. all of that is my passion mostly. Um, and so I'm such an ign ignoramus in terms of when we first started to talk about this collab that uh, I didn't really know exactly what horticulture consists of. So Nep, could you give a brief definition of what it is a horticulturalist actually does? Yeah, for sure. So I actually, I was in the same boat as you up until about a year into my horticultural schooling. So <laughs> I fell into it um, by accident, not knowing what it was. Um, I started off with an interest in genetics and biology. So that's what I went to school for, but found I preferred plant science to animal sciences. Leaned into it, picked a degree that was um, an applied science because I personally don't care for lab work. It's just not my thing. Um, so horticulture, uh, it's an applied science. It is, um, what's, what's the exact definition for it? It's small scale intensive agriculture. So that's what horticulture is. So anytime you're doing, um, agricultural work on crops that are things like fruits, vegetables, medicinals, herbs, spices, flowers, trees, uh, grasses, lawns, ornamental landscaping things, uh, anything in a greenhouse, all of that falls under horticulture. So typically when we think agriculture, we think of big farms and animal production, but horticulture is everything else. Gotcha. My, yeah, my follow-up question was going to be how it distinguishes from agriculture, and I think that I think explains it pretty well. Um, so do so you horticulture wanna... can be broken, sorry, horticulture can be broken into really specific categories as well. Like I said, there are things like turf care. Turf care is one of the most profitable, largest sectors of horticulture and the horticultural work because of how much information and maintenance is required by someone managing turf. So think of golf courses. Yeah, I can imagine. That's why, that's yeah. kind of why I don't want to own properties because I don't want to deal with it. <laughs> yeah. <a lot>. So. <laughs> it's its own organism or, or series of or its own ecosystem, I should say. I have so many opinions on lawn. I actually need to do a grass stream at some point. So I'll keep you and your community updated Ooh, on that. Touching grass. Love that. Exactly. Uh, so we're going to talk about phytoplasma today. And so phytoplasma are a group of um, pathogens that pathogenize economically important crops. So uh, this is not an exhaustive list of uh, crops that phytoplasma can infect, but it is some of the ones that people particularly care about. Coconut, sugarcane, sandalwood, cannabis, cherries, peaches, nectarines, amongst other different plants. And so to understand how this parasite functions would be really good in terms of being able to manage this pest uh, when it comes to cultivating things that we actually do care about. Uh, things so, that yeah. I do want to just point out from this list, um, canola is a major one. So canola would be more of an agronomy crop than an, a horticultural crop, um, but also um, rice. Rice is commonly um, impacted by phytoplasmas, so more of the the large scale food crops. Uh, this this is actually a really good question that uh, I think Toxo is is inadvertently bringing up in the sense of how much. Okay, <laughs> one more diversion, then we'll get back into the paper. But I am actually genuinely curious as to how long it takes day to day to maintain a garden versus a lawn, uh, in your experience. Um. I would say, on average, a garden is less intensive than a lawn, really? at least in terms of a, you know, air quotations, healthy lawn. So what people assume is, is a healthy lawn. 
the goal, the look, the green, short, lush grass. <laughs> um, like I said, the grass stream, that's a whole topic in and of itself, including lawns. Gotcha. So and maybe the history we'll of it. lawns. Maybe yeah, we'll save it for I, the grass stream. I have so much to talk about when it comes to lawn and grass. All right, let's stay focused then. So, phytoplasma, these pathogens that pathogenize plants that you care about, they cause all these interesting symptoms. Uh, and so I've never looked at a sick plant before. So getting to learn about what sick plants look like was actually quite interesting. So they cause a range of symptoms, one of which is witch's broom. And uh, Nep, can you explain to me what we're actually seeing here in witch's broom? Sure. So let me give you the definition that I found for witch's broom, which is, well, which is. <laughs> ah. Nice. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, it's a clustering of branches. And so what it is, is in your main stem of a plant. So I'm going to talk a little bit about structure here. In your main stem of a plant, you have sections that are called nodes and internodes. Nodes contain meristematic tissues, so stem cells. And so when we're looking at a witch's broom, are we seeing a mass proliferation of the cells that want to become branches? Is that what this is? Yes. Uh, very and interesting. And so what's happening is you are having an excessive amount of these meristematic tissues being produced as well as a lack of internode space. Gotcha. Yeah, that's pretty fascinating. So, it's also pretty gnarly to look at. Just viscerally, it looks quite serious. Yeah, so typically the reason, and we'll, we'll lead into this next symptom as well, this is incredibly similar to the, the phylidae that we're about to talk to, um, about. Yeah. <laughs> but um, the difference just being that witch's broom usually is used to characterize branch proliferation. And the other one's usually used to characterize leaf pro pro the proliferation. Yeah, the witch's broom looks really sick in terms of like, this, this looks um, like over the garden wall kind of like gnarly, dark fantasy kind of look, which is really neat. Uh, uh, probably plants not too happy making a bunch of branches it doesn't need. But yeah, as we said, the next symptom that phytoplasma causes is called phylidy. Um, and this one uh, inspired me to um, actually cover this one just because this symptom is so dramatic. So Nep, you want to take it away? So actually, um, one other piece, because it's not listed in the paper that we went over, but in some of the other research I went over, there's also a common disease symptom of this for bunchy fibrous secondary roots, which to me sounds like witch's broom, but in the roots. Ah, so like beneath the soil, it would also sort of look like this. And that's different in terms of the causes, I'm assuming. Yeah, so it's, it's um, the note that I made is like this appears to be witch's broom, but in roots. Oh. So secondary roots are similar to branching, but in roots. Oh, interesting. So I just wanted to point that out, that it's not just above the plant that it impacts uh, visual symptom, like visuals and structural stuff, but also below the soil surface. I almost wonder whether or not witch's broom versus, you know, what you were just talking about, whether or not there's a difference in severity, because beneath the soil, if you have a proliferation of roots, I would assume that that's not necessarily the worst thing, although that's my naive perspective. Although, like, branches above, that just seems wasteful to me. I don't know if these branches are even capable of making leaves, which is, you know, just not something that I know. Um, they, they kind of are in the sense that I, I'm familiar with um, this disease symptom, which is broom in jack pine. So jack pine is a northern pine species that is commonly infected with, um, with, and I, I can't remember exactly if it's a phytoplasma or if it's another thing that causes this symptom, but it is witch's broom. That's the symptom that's visual. Um, yeah. But it's, uh, it, they can still produce photosynthetic tissues. Oh, like the, the witch's broom can still do photosynthesis? Yeah. Like, wow. Okay, that's really they, cool. They can still produce leaves and things. The image that you have, if you look, there's snow on there. So this is a dormant, dormant tree. Right, right. Oh, okay. So this isn't like... Yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to process what the consequences for the plant would be. I guess it's not optimal to have so many. Uh, maybe yeah. 
especially when they're the crowding each other. The consequences are that this is going to cause choking in the tissues um, because plants aren't stretchy. Oh, right? cho- choking in what sense? Like the actual... In the sense that if they grow too close together and continue to expand, they're going to choke each other out because the tissues can't bend. So as wood presses into each other, it's going to cause damage. Oh, that's kind of brutal. They're growing yeah. into each other. Yeah. So this is obviously this is a mess of and if we want to flip into the next symptom, I can explain this. Yeah. Go right ahead. So phylidy is another common symptom of this disease. In fact, it's probably one of the most um important to horticulture in terms of these these things. Um, but what it is is it's the change of floral organs and floral structures to leaf-like structures. And so what's happening in this is, and this is similar to the, how witch's broom kind of has a structural change, um, the characteristic arrangement of shoots, leaves, branches, all of that on a plant is predetermined by its genetics. You call that phylotaxy. That's how we describe it. That's how we talk about it. It's the like the study of these arrangements of tissues. And so when you have a flower, you have four different sets of these kinds of tissues that appear. Um, and they appear in a structural arrangement called a whorl or a spiral. Um, whorl is the one that I learned in school, but spiral is what I saw in some of these papers I looked at. Um, but what it means is they're like little rings of tissues. So on a flower, we have four of them. We have the sepals, which are the green, um, like if you think of a rosebud before it's open, those green little leaf-like structures that enclose the bud. Those are sepals or sometimes referred to as bracts, depending on uh, the plant and the structure. And then there are also petals. There is the male reproductive whorl, which is the filaments and anthers. So the, what is it called? Stigmas? God, I'm having a moment. I always mess these two up. But there's the male reproductive parts, and then there's the female reproductive organs as a whorl as well. And that is the I believe the style, or maybe that's the stigma. God damn, I can't remember. They're both S's. And so either this, way. Yeah, and so and so this symptom in particular, what like to me as a, as someone who is naive in terms of plants, it looks like on the surface that the flowers, the flower petals have failed to actually form. And so yeah. Um, so each of these tissues, instead of the stem cells of this what should be a floral organ, instead of them differentiating into their um their correct cells their correct differentiated cells they're reverting and going back to the um the information that would code for a leaf yes and so so rather than specializing into reproductive structures it's going back into more of just a functional structure and, so and that's this is, how you get these leaf-like pieces shooting out of a flower head. And so this is something that I had asked you behind the scenes because of my supreme ignorance in terms of like how these cell types are related. So I think I had asked you how different the destinies of these cell types actually are. So if we imagine in mammalian cells, you know, a very potent stem cell can become any number of things, right? Brain tissue, uh, bone, uh, you know, neutrophils. Um, But to me, morphologically, leaves and petals do look very similar. And so out of ignorance, I had assumed that the reversion of petal to leaf is not that dramatic. Um, And then you had corrected me in terms of the destiny of a petal is quite different than the cell destiny of a leaf that even though they might share similar physical features that the genetics underneath are actually quite different which is something that i appreciate learning yeah um i think the way i described it then is the the floral stem cells the ones that are supposed to differentiate into flowers um 
those are reproductive cells. So that would be any cell that's supposed to differentiate into part of the reproductive system. Like a Your gonad or cells a... And the differentiation for a leaf cell is a lot more similar to skin. Oh, that's funky. <laughs> so that's like the difference in organ purpose and everything. Like they're totally different in purpose. They're super different in function. They're super different in structure. And these things also don't count as legitimate leaves because there is a structural element missing. And so when we talk about leaves and true leaves, um, the way they attach to the main stem as well as their leaves are complicated. There's a lot to them and a lot of different parts. <laughs> gotcha. So essentially, um, if we're talking about like trying to conceptualize they, yeah. what these are in terms they of... They miss the midrib. There is no midrib to these leaves. In other words, no these are like... main stem. They're kind of like... Or petiole. Like a... What, a what, um, like abom <laughs> abomination is maybe a strong word. But they're malformed. Uh, I think yeah, that's so accurate to say. Here is what I can say. So phyllidae is the symptom. But an individual, one of those little leaf-like structures that comes off that flower head is called a phyllode. And here's a definition of it. A phyllode is an expanded petiole or leaf stem resembling and having the function of a leaf, but without a true leaf blade. What's interesting to me about this in particular is that I don't, I don't know of a mammalian cell biology equivalent to something like this. Um, I don't know if anybody in chat has any idea of how you could draw a parallel. And that's kind of why it fascinates me in the sense that this is something that I don't see. I mean, I get, you know, with fly genetics, you can do all sorts of weird things to flies, but this like half organ concept, mm -hmm. I think is very interesting. All right, let's yeah. move on to the next symptom, I think. So viricense, what is viricense? Yeah, so that's just the greening of the tissues. So it's more of a color. Uh, it's, a it's a very visual <laughs> symptom. Um, and the difference from the phyllidae is that it's not changing the structure of the cells. Uh, viricense can also appear in phyllidae because of the color change. But viricense on its own is just the color change. And so virescence is the increased um, content of, um, oh gosh, what's it called? Chlorophyll? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Got you. I still remember I always, something I, about I plants. Brain fart. I brain fart so easily when I'm talking about stuff. Um, but yes, there's an increased content of chlorophyll. These tissues become more photosynthetic. And there is, um, and I, I did want to make a point about this. Um, and also in regards to the, uh, the phyllidae. Um, so, where are we here? Where did I write this? Yes. So I had someone ask while I was doing this background research, like, are there advantages to these symptoms displayed in the plant host? And yeah. Phyllidae and virescence, the advantage to those is that a plant is now pushing its energy into a floral structure, but inadvertently, because this floral structure is green, leaf-like, and has increased photosynthetic potential, it leads to the production of more sugars, which is more food for the bugs that are visiting and transmitting the disease, but also more food for the phytoplasmas themselves because they rely on this sugar content that is a byproduct or a product of photosynthesis. I can't help but feel that there's this parallel um, and it just occurred to me so I didn't have time to like really make sure I get this correctly um, but tumor cells do have an increased demand for nutrients as well. I mean whether or not a tumor is a pathogen is you know debatable but in the sense that when you are granted an evolutionary edge in terms of cra like grafting out a niche for yourself and 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 existing in the struggle for life it seems that metabolic hijacking seems to be quite beneficial so i think that that's quite fascinating that like the plant would rather have a bee pollinate it so that the plant can spread its own genes but instead this kind of pathogen is preventing that kind of 
I'm, I'm assuming it's preventing that kind of signaling that would allow for a pollinator to do its job and instead forcing it to make more food instead, which I think is, which I think is very neat and very uh, visible too. Yeah. And I think we have a discussion point to talk about later on that ties back into that. So we'll kind of put a pin, pin in that bit and come back to it when we talk about the insect host. Yes. So let's, let's move on. So Part of why phytoplasma are so interesting to talk about is how animatic and cryptic they are. In fact, back in the 1960s, uh, phytoplasma were, uh, I guess, not quite isolated, but observed to cause this disease called mulberry dwarf disease. So on the left, we have a healthy mulberry plant, and on the right, we have a diseased plant. The image quality isn't the best, but you can see that there's a bit of yellowing in the right-hand figure and a bit more... Um, I don't even know what to call it. Like, there appear to be more leaves, a more smaller leaves. Uh, for some reason, they just don't look right to me. I don't have the vocabulary to really describe Do it. Do you want me to, to talk about what dwarfism is in a plant? Uh, maybe real quick, if you can do it in like three sentences. Yes. So it's, it's the shortening of those internodal spaces. So similar to witch's broom, but less severe because it's not causing branching. But it is decreasing the, uh, the internodal space between leaf structures gotcha so if you decrease the internodal space then you increase the frequency by which you generate these structures right yeah and, and so what it is is it's not changing the number of plant cells plant height is determined by how long these cells will stretch before they they solidify and lignify completely well that's kind of interesting too um there's also a symptom that follows along with plants that are in too much shade, they don't get enough light, they stretch and they elongate. It's kind of the opposite. So that is called etiolation, and dwarfing is when they they aren't really stretching properly. Uh, very cool. Um, so the thing about phytoplasma when they were first discovered is that they were originally thought to be viral instead of bacterial. So phytoplasma are bacteria, but for a long time they were thought to be viral. And why might that be? Because phytoplasma are incredibly difficult to study. So they're what's known as an obligate intracellular parasite. In other words, it is a parasite that cannot exist outside of their hosts. So what I have here is a electron micrograph uh, of a plant that is infected by phytoplasma. So I would have loved to show you what this bacteria looks like, but I can't actually do that unless I also show you its existence within the plant. And so the reason why they thought that this vector was viral was because they could not get this thing to grow in a dish, uh, which is also pretty interesting for other reasons because bacteria are really easy well not all of them but generally bacteria are really easy to culture so um the molecular biologist's best friend e coli uh very easy to grow you can grow it as cold as four degrees celsius so like your refrigerator temperature all the way up to 42 is what i've seen uh so that's basically growing between refrigerator temperature and very, very hot day temperature. Uh, and all you need for them to grow is a bit of water, a little salt. The growth factor is located in yeast extract and some supplementary protein, right? Bacteria are really, really in, uh, easy to, to grow generally. Um, and so, uh, bye John the eosinophil. Uh, so, not only are E. coli easy to grow, but there are bacteria that grow even in places where you don't want them to, including the bacteria Serratia. So Serratia are a uh, class of bacteria that grow uh, in, in just freaking water in your bathroom, right? So anytime you see this pink ring around your sinks, uh, that is Serratia growing. So it doesn't take a lot for bacteria to grow, which is why the fact that phytoplasma are so difficult to grow is surprising. Uh, so even uh, even bacteria love Vegemite, says that Bill Cipher. Uh, no, no, that's not Bill <laughs> Cipher. That's uh, Ser uh, Sergey. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeast extract is great, um, and so yes, yeah, even Serratia. Uh, sorry, E. coli love that stuff. Um, 
This slide is a particularly poignant slide with regards to if you've ever spent a day in a mammalian cell culture lab, bacteria will grow even in places you do not want them to. So what is imaged here is a plate of mammalian cells. That's these triangle-ish, rhombus, kite-shaped cells. Uh, and if you are sloppy with your sterile technique, they will be infected by bacteria, which you can see under this microscope as these tiny little rods. So once again, uh, bacteria really easy to grow, but phytoplasma surprisingly not so. And so I want to talk a little bit about why they're so difficult to grow outside of their hosts. And this is going to come down... Um, to its evolutionary history and so here i have a little bit of a fun guessing game uh for those of you in chat uh does anybody know how many dna base pairs are in humans and how many genes protein coding genes that actually codes for i'm wondering if anybody in chat wants to take a guess and you know don't look it up that's cheating but but just guess you know it's, it's kind of a fun thing to do if anyone from my community is here can you please guess, uh, or at least try to remember, if you remember, okay, season finale of season one from the X-Files, what was discovered about, you know, air quotations discovered, <laughs> about the genes? Uh, sorry, it says <laughs> at least three. That's definitely true. There are at least three DNA base pairs and at least three genes. Okay, I want to give you a know. hint. There's a word in there called pairs, called pairs. Uh, pairs. So, so I'm not looking for a chromosome number, but I am looking for just the number of bases. It might, it might be kind of hard to get. I might, I might, I might uh, swoop in and, and just... Uh, uh, it's four. Oh, it's four, <laughs> guys. I so, so that actually wasn't my intention with the question. So yes, there are four different DNA base pairs. That is true. But in terms of the number of them in, in the human genome, so how long, how much DNA is packed inside a cell? Um, so that Lots. answer would be 3 billion. So there are four DNA bases, uh, A, G, T, and C. And the length of the DNA that you have, so the amount of data that is stored inside your cells, is equivalent to 3 billion. So 3 billion of those DNA uh, base molecules. That length of DNA codes for 20,000 proteins. It's kind of a hard number to wrap your mind around, but actually to me, it's quite surprising. 20,000 doesn't actually seem all that much, uh, but that's what we understand to be true so far. That's um, what your mind is made out of. Wow. Yeah. Sorry. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. And so E. coli, uh, if, we, if we have 3 billion base pairs, E. coli, a, the humble bacteria, uh, only has 5 million. So we're about a thousand times more complex with regards to the amount of genetic information that we have than our bacterial distant cousins. So uh, that equates to about 4,000 protein coding genes. So this is also quite surprising, right? Because if we go by the number of proteins that we make, we only actually make about five times more proteins than E. coli, and yet we go from, you know, a single-celled bacteria to, to the humans that we are. Uh, and I think that's fascinating because there's some gap of information that is uh, hidden, not hidden, but coded for in those DNA base pairs that might not necessarily be easily explainable when we look at just proteins. So, phytoplasma are even smaller than E. coli, so we're down to almost less than a million in terms of some strains of base pairs. And we've gone from 4,000 proteins all the way down to about 400 in the smallest of phytoplasma. So that to me is absolutely bonkers with regards to how this thing is even able to exist. So I'm going to call phytoplasma very genomically efficient parasites so may i ask a question regarding this because yes, it's something that i thought about but didn't do any research on yeah go ahead how similar is this to a prion uh so a prion is a protein that uh i don't remember 
how many species make it, but at least mammals do. A prion is a protein that neurons make uh, in the brain. And mm -hmm. the function of that protein is not quite well characterized, but we think it has something to do with maintaining synapse structure. So the connections between neurons. Prions okay. as a disease, when they misfold, they cause other prions to misfold. And so misfolded proteins can propagate their state of misfolding. What that ends up happening is that all of these prions end up aggregating into this junk garbage that builds up in the neurons and eventually causes them to die. Um, so oh, they're, okay. they're not really related to DNA. Um, I mean, DNA, you require DNA to make them, um, but they're kind mm -hmm. of, they're kind of a separate discussion. Okay. That was all I was really curious about, because I know those are intracellular technically. Yes, they're also intracellular. Not structurally the same as a cell. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're so. proteins, much smaller than cells. Yeah. So this okay. is a Sounds very... Good very genome efficient parasites so they've jettisoned a lot of their dna uh if you don't the rule of life basically is if you don't need it you lose it and so they've gotten away over evolutionary time pruning down their own genetic code uh, uh, they did nature's version of file compression kind of yeah i'm trying to simplify it into my communities yeah, I, I think it might be more like code deletion. Because <laughs> when you compress a file, you can still extract it and then retain that information. So I think this is just like highlighting a good bit of code and then just hitting backspace. Uh, they don't True. need a lot of that functionality anymore. So this to me is interesting because it makes me think of the paradox of the heap. And I'm wondering if uh, chat has heard of the paradox of the heap. I'm going to give you a second to kind of recall what this might be in that kind of context while I look at chat. But the paradox and of the heap is... you guys would like information on, you know, this pile of dirt, I have a whole video on it if you look at my channel later. You've done a dirt video? <laughs> Dude, I have a whole lecture on soil. Oh. Soil is interesting to me for a separate reason in terms of um, understanding which microbes actually are capable of surviving in soil. Because from what I understand, uh, soil is n pretty hard for things to grow in, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, I think when we talk about bioremediation, maybe at some point in the future, uh, the usage of genetically engineered bacteria to sort of clean up the environment, it might be that might be a good collab to do because while I know a lot about bacteria, I don't really know a lot about soil, so that'd be kind of neat. Soil is cool, but you're going to have to learn a bit more about fungal cells. Ah, uh, yeah, that makes sense. So that's going to be where we go if we go into the, the cellular biology of, of soils. That'd be very neat. Uh, it looks like Bill Cipher and Chat's got the answer. So the paradox of the heap basically asks, how many grains of sand do you need for a pile to become a heap? Uh, and so if you have a heap of sand and you start removing individual grains, at what point do you get something that can't be called a heap? And so the fact that phytoplasma are so small makes me think of this paradox because these bacteria are super, super tiny. Like some of the smallest organisms on this planet. They don't have a cell wall, which a lot of bacteria do, and they lack the genes for something called a pentose phosphate cycle, which is like glycolysis. So major, major metabolic uh, pathways, the genes required to break down sugar to have energy, this parasite just jettisoned them, didn't need them anymore because they're so good at being parasites. What surprises me is that not only did they jettison their pentose phosphate cycle, but that they also jettisoned their ATP synthase subunits. So for those of you who don't know, ATP is a molecule that the cell uses to do work. So you burn a molecule of ATP anytime. This is an oversimplification, but you use ATP to uh, activate enzymes, to move proteins, etc., etc. And generally, the definition of life has included some metric of self-sufficiency when it comes to making your own energy. So the fact that this bacteria doesn't make its own uh, F0, F1 synthase is really shocking. Um, 
there's you don't really encounter too many bacteria that don't have this enzyme they can't make their own atp using this particular protein so we're really pruning away what we think of as what is technically alive uh so i have some questions from chat so it looks like uh the, uh, what does less DNA mean for an organism, though? Less DNA doesn't mean that they reproduce easier, does it? That's true. So the amount of DNA in an organism doesn't really give you that much explanatory power, except for this point that I'm making here, which is this organism has evolved to be highly, highly efficient with its genome. Like, it doesn't need that many genes to survive is kind of the point that I'm getting across. Um, okay. Okay. So I have this table here. I'm going to move NEP for a second. And in terms of like, you know, yesterday I had made a post about like biology is so interesting I had to lie down. And <laughs> this idea of this minimum unit of life really got to me in a kind of way. So if we blow up this table, we can see that from left to right, we kind of get like um, less complex, right? And so phytoplasma live here. And the thing is, is that there are actually viruses out there that are as big, if not bigger, than phytoplasma. So there's a class of viruses called giant viruses that have as much DNA as a phytoplasma does. They have as many protein coding gene as a phytoplasma does. They also are obligate intracellular parasites. So not only do these two things cannot exist outside of their host, but they are similarly genetically complex. And while eventually people learned how to culture phytoplasma outside of the cell, it only happened with great difficulty. And so even though phytoplasma and giant viruses are so similar in this regard, we for some reason give the phytoplasma the label of living, but the giant virus the label of not living. So I just think that's really interesting in the sense that and this is something that everybody should know about biology, is that sometimes when you label things, you label it out of convenience and not out of some kind of deeper biological truth. I'm not going to name any names with regards to the subject that I'm referring to, but just know that a lot of biology, whether you believe it or not, is actually on a spectrum. Uh, so not only is the definition of a species kind of like iffy but so is the definition of life itself the thing about labels is that it's it's useful for researchers because it has their purpose um but in terms of when you look really carefully at things those labels don't always hold up very well so um, oh, uh yeah. similarly this is also a presentation i've done and is available in vod format on my youtube channel here um, a talk about what scientific classification is. Yeah, so scientific classification is something that I'm not tremendously familiar with outside of an intro lesson. So I think that would be very fun to get into in the sense of like, just because something is called something doesn't necessarily mean that you draw hard lines in the sand in terms of uh, the buckets that you put. Yeah, and there's, there's different ways of classifying things and their relation to each other. And so in that presentation, I go into the different ways that um, ecologists kind of distinguish things, but also genetically how things would be related. And then I give some examples. And that'd be really if you're good. interested in seeing and learning a bit more of the basics of that kind of classification, and why we label things and what those labels can mean and the origins of them, there is a presentation already there. Very, very cool. Uh, so, getting it back into the goal of the paper, um, despite phytoplasma having such a tiny, tiny, tiny genome, they evolve to infect both plants and insects. So not only do they barely have like DNA inside of them, that DNA is actually able to adjust their lifestyle accordingly depending on whether or not they're in a plant or whether or not they're in a an insect and so to me that's surprising because it already has so little genetic information how in the heck did it evolve to live in these two very very different environments and so i'm going to go ahead and hand this over to nep uh, to explain the dynamic between the insect the plant and phytoplasma so uh go ahead nep okay um 
can I get you to perhaps structure my explanation? So where do you want me to start? Yeah, so why don't we start with the uh, leaf hopper, the bug? Uh, so we'll <laughs> okay, start so with an infected itself. bug. Yeah, so we'll start with an infected, uh, a leaf hopper with <clears throat> phytoplasma. Yeah, okay. So I'm just going to kind of talk towards phytoplasma vectoring for a moment and then go into the insect. Um, firstly, vectoring and vectors are just the mode of transportation when it comes to um, the pathogens. So vectoring just means how does it get from point A to point B? Um, it's based on a math term, vectors. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to talk about why things like leafhoppers are common uh, vectors for phytoplasmas. And the reason behind that is leafhoppers and some of the other common insects that are um, hosts of phytoplasmas. So leafhoppers, plant hoppers, psyllids, um, these are all things from the insect order Hemiptera. And while Hemiptera are a very large, diverse group of insects, um, they're considered the true bugs, and many, 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 many of them are, um, they consume plant material as their main food source. They're not, many of them are not omnivores, many of them are not carnivores, they're strictly, uh, strictly herbivore. Um, and what they do is if they have piercing slash sucking style mouth parts, which these insects do, so leaf hoppers, um, you can see this style of mouth part in listed underneath B in that diagram. This mouth looks insane, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, oh, hi, Hal. Hello. So insect mouth parts are just like generally categories, categorized by the way they eat. So the structure of their mouth parts and what they have as a food source and how they digest it impacts all of like they they're related. So piercing sucking mouth parts. These are the mouth parts of things like butterflies like mosquitoes, like leaf hoppers. They can be structured differently in that some insects can't retract them. So um, my favorite example of that would be the bee fly, Bombylidae. Um, or they can curl like in butterflies. Um, and what they do is they act mechanically like a siphon. And if you're familiar with a siphon, <laughs> it's a water or it's a it's a pressure differential that pulls liquid from one end of something to another. In order to create that pressure differential, you have to create a little bit of a vacuum where you're collecting the liquid from. And so to do that, because an insect mouth is made of four separate parts. And the way they're fused together in this um, siphon styled mouth part, there's more or less a tongue that sticks out and then pulls back. And because of that retraction action, <laughs> it, it starts to pull the, uh, the liquid in. Majority of these insect vectors for our talk consume sap. Sap is the liquid found in the plant that contains the byproducts of photosynthesis, as well as other proteins, enzymes, and signaling chemicals. What happens is this phytoplasma, which is in the insect, when siphoning and starting that siphon action, the saliva of the insect enters these sap carrying channels and that is how it enters into the plant can i relate this to the bee movie 
Um, <laughs> no. Unrelatable. I could do a whole stream on why I hate the B movie. <laughs> that would be pretty fun. Okay. Um, I, I want to give a shout out to Thistle Violet, who's in the uh, chat. Uh, Thistle is another, um, I don't know what to call us, stem tuber, uh, maybe? Thistle, Thistle, if you're still in chat, please feel free to plug yourself and welcome to the stream. I um, called us, uh, I did hashtag science tuber. Science tuber. We're still, we're, we're, <laughs> we're trying things out. We're trying things out. <sighs> All right. So when the leaf hopper feeds on these plants, basically, it it is able to use its mouth parts to basically transfer this uh, pathogen to the phloem, uh, which we'll talk about later in this stream. But basically, you have the cycle where the infected leaf hopper will infect a healthy plant by feeding on it. That healthy so plant will um, ha be infested with the phytoplasma, and then an uninfected a uh, leaf hopper can then pick up an infection from an infected plant which mirrors very closely what happens in malaria where yes. the you know the, oh i wish i'd written down i should know this in terms of so which parasite I causes can talk malaria about, yeah uh, i can talk a little bit about that um and so it's the same concept so malaria is transferred in mosquito saliva and so it's the same kind of mouth parts. It's piercing, sucking mouth parts. So it's able to get into the bloodstream. And it's the same exact thing that's happening. The mosquito saliva, a small amount of it, makes it into the bloodstream. And the enzymes in that, proteins in that, cause um, a histamine reaction in us. That is why a mosquito bite causes an itchy little bump. Yeah, so so we're going to be seeing a lot of adaptation with regards to the interplay between these different species. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so... There are other symptoms that are more similar to mosquito bite symptoms in plants, but that's a talk for another day. Yeah, so going back to why we care about learning about phytoplasma and why we're interested in learning about how their basic biology works is because they're difficult to control. So I don't actually know too much about the context for this, but Nep, if you could in like, you know, two to four sentences, talk a little bit about why the current methods by which we control phytoplasma are insufficient, that'd be great. Control. <clears throat> Currently, because we really don't understand phytoplasmas. They're very new to scientific research. Um, we don't have things to specifically manage phytoplasmas. There is the increased challenge that phytoplasmas exist inter intracellularly, meaning they are inside the plant cell. They are not existing between the plant cells. They're inside the plant cell. So when it comes to management, the only um, real options that we currently have available are insecticides, physical removal of the infected individual plants, and practicing IPM on site. So IPM is integrated pest management. It is something that is stressed to people who produce uh, foods as well as um, just gardeners in general. IPM is the agricultural concept of preventative maintenance. So things you can do on site to prevent issues from arising. So to some if we learned more about the phytoplasma's biology, we could potentially craft technologies that would be surgically catered towards their control versus these more general, maybe more inefficient methods of management. So I can talk a little bit more to these pieces as well. I think so maybe first of all, we might uh, loop back to these control methods probably after we get uh, through the paper, maybe. Uh, because okay, I, I want to get started on the oh. data. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we'll definitely this talk is, about that. The only thing I wanted to mention here um, is when it comes to pesticides with this and why pesticides are kind of a bad route. 
Do you want me to save that for after or for now? Uh, if you could do it quickly, because uh, we're, we're an hour okay. in and I want to get to the paper. <laughs> phytoplasmas existing inside the cell means that you cannot target the phytoplasmas without also targeting the host cell. At the same time, most pesticides kill indiscriminately, especially because we don't have ones that currently impact specifically phytoplasmas. That means that they also kill your um, natural predators and other beneficial insects in the space. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. So if we, if, yeah. we knew, if we knew more about phytoplasmas, we could potentially craft a treatment for these plants that would be selective for their management, yeah. which would be the goal. The here. other thing that I want to mention is the kind of chemical um, that you would need, the application style that you would need for a phytoplasma targeting pesticide would be something called a systemic pesticide meaning it's applied through the roots, um, it's uptaken into the plant, and it's distributed through the entire plant. It is systemic. Systemic pesticides have been slowly phased out by most governments because of how detrimental they can be to biodiversity and how toxic they can be. So there are huge challenges and risks to developing chemicals that will kill these things. However, this paper wants to look at host switching genes because if you can trigger this, the phytoplasma to behave like the insect environment, it will not cause the damage, or at least that's the idea. Or rather, I'll sort of hedge that um, a little bit in the sense where if we know which genes are on in the plant, we might be able to develop technologies that will shut them down while they're in the plant. So maybe not necessarily mm -hmm. looking insect-like, but just yeah. if we know what they need for surviving in the plant, if we shut them down, that might be a pretty good way to get them out. So, so uh, I, I wrote this in a sentence here. So plants facing these obligate pathogens, they require genetic defense. Things that cannot be applied to a currently affected crop, things that are inside of a crop and are part of their own internal defense system, because most of these agricultural chemicals should only be treated as a last defense strategy. Yeah, so uh, we can so. craft, we're, we're not at that stage yet in terms of this particular paper, but this sets the groundwork, sets the stage for hopefully developing a technology like that in the future. So yeah. the particular strain of phytoplasma that we are talking about is responsible for something called uh, aster yellow in terms of the disease that it causes. And so, Nep, do you want to talk about... You want to know something that? I learned about this? Yeah, hit me. The disease that they picked causes not aster yellows, but onion yellows. Oh, so it is in fact not the same group of phytoplasmas as aster yellows. I see, so I've picked the wrong figure. Oops. <laughs> no, I wanted to bring this up because the papers focus on the impacts of aster yellows, not this one in particular because it really doesn't talk about those things. It just gives you the intro background. But in, in say, the, uh, the other major resource I looked at, um, and in terms of economical importance, it's typically aster yellows that is known and is an issue. This onion yellows is a lot less common, but where the paper and the study was designed and done, it affects many local crops. Oh, so, this... so we don't see it in North America as much because we don't produce those crops as often. But the variety they picked is more locally important to their region. I think this more is regionally important. Really interesting in the sense that in my experience, the type of work that I grew, grew up with, that I was learning about, was quite <clears throat> global in the sense of like my training. So the fact that there are these like 
I mean, you've made the a very good observation that like science can be local too, that scientists are needed at every level of innovation. Yeah, I would say it's very, very, sorry. <clears throat> it's very relevant to horticulture because our crops are so different to each region. Very. <laughs> as well as the insect pests and types of diseases. All right. So the goal of this paper is to take this particular strain of phytoplasma and determine which genes are on in the plant versus which genes are on in the insect. So I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and walk through how this was done experimentally. So the researchers started with a population of infected leafhoppers and they uh, had them hang out with a bunch of garland chrysanthemums. So these are going to be the host and the plant, uh, the um, insect and the plant for our experiment. And then, Would you like uh, me to mention why they picked those? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, so a garland chrysanthemum is both an ornamental and a food crop. Uh, typically in North America, it is considered a um, showy, flowery annual. And in... Um, East Asia, um, so in a handful of countries around East Asia, uh, including Japan, where this study took place, um, they're used for greens, and they're consumed. That's actually the leaf hopper species picked is one of the most common in that region. I, I love that you've honed in. I, I didn't actually put those together in terms of the the motivation to pick the system, but that. That does sound quite relevant to where they would be. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so the leafhopper and the chrysanthemum uh, in this case. So once, once we've got our infected plants, what we, what, uh, sorry, what the authors do is something called a microarray analysis. And so this is a technique that you can do to determine the gene expression of an organism very quickly uh, with relatively decent definition. So what do I mean by that? A microarray analysis uh, allows you to measure the levels of RNA for a lot of the genome. And so RNA is the midpoint in between DNA and protein, protein being the molecules that do biology pretty much, right? So if you measure the amount of RNA, you can get a sense for how much the cell in that moment is making protein. So what genes are being made into protein is, is sort of the, the goal of this technique. And so how this happens is you take the leafhopper and you take the chrysanthemum that's been infected by the uh, phytoplasma and you extract all the RNA. Now RNA is very fragile. We used to joke that if you were working with RNA in one room, that if somebody sneezed in the other room, that all of your RNA would degrade. So, um... For, for, um, I guess my viewers who may not be aware as to why it would degrade separately, your DNA is enclosed in a nucleus, it has an extra layer of protection, your RNA leaves the nucleus in order to interact with other cell components. DNA also has chemical differences than RNA, which makes them mm -hmm. a bit more resilient to just blowing up in the wind. Um, yeah. And so uh, once you extract that RNA and there is an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, which you might know from HIV, that turns RNA into DNA. And so once you do that reverse transcription, turning RNA to DNA, you stabilize it. And that also gives you room to add in a label. So the DNA that was made from the RNA from the insect is labeled one color, so we'll call it red, and then the other uh, sample coming from the plant is labeled with green. So now you have all of the RNA in the species that's been converted into different DNAs, which are then labeled uh, with a fluorescent dye. And so you can take these samples that have been labeled and flow them over a chip that has been printed with complementary DNA sequences. In other words, just to keep it kind of uh, a, a big overall view, you have a chip and if you get a uh, DNA signal that is detected, you get some level of fluorescence. Uh, so 
before you uh, put on the DNA samples, you have something that doesn't fluoresce. So up here, you see that before you add the samples, that genes one, two, three, and four are all colorless. And then after you put the sample over it, if there is a complementary gene, uh, then the gene, the DNA will bind, and then you can detect that resultant fluorescence. So here in this little cartoon, I've shown that gene one is on in the plant, gene two and three are on in the insect, and gene four is in the plant. And if you measure how bright that fluorescence is, you can determine how much of that RNA was originally in that sample. So. Um, if you didn't quite like get all of that, that's totally okay. What this basically means is that you can measure how much RNA is in the sample and what type of RNA it is. And so this is an experiment where they plotted the fluorescence intensity, so the brightness of each sample. So each one of these dots is a different gene. Okay, each one of these dots is a different gene, and on one axis here you have a plus so one chrysanthemum chrysanthemum A, and on this other axis, you have chrysanthemum B. And the values here are fluorescence intensity, so how bright those signals are. And you get this really nice straight line, which makes sense. So the genes that are on in chrysanthemum A are also on in chrysanthemum B, meaning that there aren't like random variations. So this makes a lot of sense. Um, Similarly, in panel C, you see that genes that are on in host A, so uh, like this point over here, genes that are highly, highly, highly being made in uh, leafhopper A are also highly, highly made in leafhopper B. And so because these two lie on a straight line, we get a general sense for how consistent this parasite is. When you map these genes on uh, an insect host and a plant host, Instead of this nice straight line, you get this shapeless blob, which means that there is significant, there's a significant difference in the genes that are turned on in the leafhopper versus the uh, plant, which makes a lot of sense. The authors quantified this and showed that 33% of this already very tiny bacteria are differentially expressed. In other words, a third of the genome is different between. Uh, is expressed differently between the insect and the plant. Um, so does, does that kind of make sense? That we're looking for genes that are differently expressed in the plant versus the insect host. So a good example of that would be something like this point all the way over here. It looks like this particular gene, really, really bright in the plant, not very bright in the insect. So these are the genes that we would want to investigate to try to see if there are genes that we can mm, assassinate is the wrong word, but but target uh, for treatment. Yeah. So can I can I add in the uh, kind of the pest management application of these genes? Yep. So the reasoning behind why you would want to focus in on these differences in gene expression is largely due to the fact that the host and the part of the host that um, this phytoplasma resides in, the environment itself is vastly different. If you wanted to compare it to mammals, it would be like going from the blood system to the stomach. Yeah, it's also crazy because... If we think about malaria, malaria, the jump between mosquito and human, I mean, that's quite big, right? Like, we are quite mm -hmm. different than insects, but we're still both animals. The phytoplasma yeah. has to jump between a plant and an animal. Those are very, very different environments. So it's very cool to see um, yeah. this differential expression. And I actually also want to mention that in terms of evolution, as an from an evolutionary standpoint, the two-stage life cycle the the separation of of distinct life cycle stages that need to take place in different environments is is actually been around for a really really long time in plants um some of the um most i guess air quotations primitive plants mosses ferns require a two-stage life cycle uh, i wonder why that might i guess i guess that's not at all unusual <laughs> i was like mm, yeah is the, no, so like that, that, something that like a phytoplasma 
you know, like their life cycle, including this two step piece, isn't necessarily a novel, like life cycle habit. Right. For me, what it is does unique about in this nature. is that with a genome so small that it is capable of living in two very different systems, which is very cool. Yes. I see uh, Dr. Sorry, Total I went Hex. more into background there. The application being that if you can switch the expressed genes into like in the plant, if you can get either the plant or an applied uh, pesticide to cause that gene expression change or to trigger whatever it is that causes that change, um, it would no longer be able to exist inside the plant host because it can't protect itself from the environment anymore. Yeah, so we're, we're going to get into a very that. good defense mechanism. We're going to get into that in a little bit. Uh, I just want to shout yeah. out a Dr. Toto Hex who's in the chat. Uh, another uh, uh, stem tuber. Uh, feel free to plug yourself uh, and I hope you enjoy the stream. Um, so. Yeah, so we really want to check to see which genes are totally on in the in, in the plant, more on in the plant than in the insect, to try to determine the basic biology of this system. So they, uh, the authors, put together this chromosome and mapped out exactly which genes are more expressed where. So in this outer ring, you see a bunch of bars that are either red or green, and so the bars that are red are genes that are up in the insect, and the bars that are green are up in the plant. Now, part of my pet peeve here is that red and green is the most common form of colorblindness, uh, so that isn't great, um, but I'll... I'll Turn the information into something more readable in just a little bit. So they have this rough look with a microarray. Um, so just blasting the entire genome, seeing which genes are up and which genes are down. And then they took a subset of those genes and did something called RT-qPCR. So this is a technique that will really allow you with better confidence determine which, uh, how much RNA is in a particular sample. So the process is very similar to a microarray. So you extract and quantify the RNA. And again, RNA is the midpoint between DNA and proteins. So if you know how much RNA is in your sample, you know which proteins are being made and in what quantity. Uh, and so the way that this is done is actually quite neat. Um, so you start off by extracting this RNA, and again, that reverse transcriptase makes DNA out of that RNA. You degrade the RNA, uh, so you're left with just the DNA, and then you add a known primer. So this is, you're hunting for genes now that you suspect might be upregulated. Uh, and then that amplifies, or not amplifies, but it, it causes the DNA to then become double-stranded. And then you can then add in a green dye that glows when it's added to double-stranded DNA. So this technique allows you to, with better precision, really get at whether or not genes are up or down regulated. And here is that data. So in red, we have the data from the RTQPCR, and in blue, we have the microarray. So basically, what we want to see is that blue and red are in agreement. That gives us greater confidence that our techniques were working properly. The values that are above zero are genes that are more upregulated in the plant. So those are our best candidates for uh, treatment. And the bar below zero is genes that are more upregulated in the insect. Uh, thank you for hanging out, Sergey. Uh, uh, thank you so much for showing up. So, what nice are these? Here. So, what are these mystery proteins? So, there are proteins that are involved in protein folding, which are a pretty important uh, stretch detecting of stretches in the membrane. So, tension-related uh, proteins. You have proteins that are DNA binding, and then because phytoplasma are just that mysterious, there are a whole bunch of proteins whose functions are completely not known, um, which is very exciting for me in particular. Now, something that might catch your eye is this bar over here, PAM486, and what I want to know is what the heck is this? This is a protein of unknown function. We know that it's secreted because we can make that guess from the DNA sequence. That is really, really highly produced in the plant, but not in the insect. So this is a really good candidate for something that we can target for treatment of phytoplasm in the plant. Now, I want to go to this next figure that they've made that will kind of aggregate all of the data that they've 
put together here. And it's this whole horrible looking thing that we're not going to look too carefully at, but I am going to zoom in here. So if a box is green, that means it is more in the plant. And if it is red, then it is more in the insect. And so I've highlighted a couple of interesting genes to point out. And so the more green it is, the more it is related to the plant. And we have here um, something called a multi-drug transporter. And so I'm not entirely sure what this does, but it does look like the phytoplasm really makes this uh, protein when it's in the plant. And it looks like a pump. It looks like this protein pumps something in or out of the cell. And the fact that it's called the multi-drug transporter makes me think that this is maybe a protein that was evolved to avoid getting killed by the plant. I don't really know how that happens, Nep. I don't know if you know anything about chemical defenses <laughs> in plants, like within a cell. Yes. Little bits. I recall reading this bit. Can you, uh, I need you to say the term again. Uh, chemical defense against pathogens in a plant um, something before that a uh, multi-drug transporter that. yeah multi-drug transporter where was that from um, uh, while you hunt for you... that i can talk about some of the other things that i've noticed in this map as well one question before you do that yeah in the do you know was it in this paper yes uh, what are you... MSCL? Is that what it was? Oh, yeah, we're going to get to that in just a moment. Um, cause that's... But is that the multi? Oh, no, yes. they're actually separate. They're actually separate. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'm the multi-drug transporter is something that I'm hypothesizing to be something that protects it from chemical warfare uh, that the plant might in evoke onto the pathogen. Oh. Yes. So... Multi-drug efflux pumps. Um, yeah. That has to do with how things are moved in and out of the uh, the plant cell because of the cell wall. Whereas um, things like mammalian cells only have a membrane and diffusion is possible. So you diffusion... Need pump channels to push things through the cell wall. So... Uh... Mammalian cells also do have pumps and channels as well. Uh, this one appears yeah. to maybe be particular for plants, which I think is kind of interesting. Yeah, um, and that would be the difference is like it, it would be more related to a cell wall than a membrane. A plant cell has both, but mm. a cell wall is a unique structure to a plant cell and fungi and, well, I guess just not animal cells. Uh, yeah. Because uh, you have and, capsules on bacteria and stuff too. Uh, but I'm more wondering kind of what this multi-drug is. Like what it actually is pumping might be an interesting topic for to look into. Mm -hmm. um, because the fact that it's called multi-drug makes me think that it is a chemical defense system. Yeah, I would assume, like for, this is just an assumption here because I'm not really familiar with the term. Um, but... My assumption, based on how plant terminology usually comes together, is that it would be a pump that works to quickly get um, signaling enzymes out of a cell. So yeah. yes, in terms of defense mechanisms, because it's called multi-drug, it would be capable of pushing a variety of different kinds of these things out. Uh, and I think that's a pretty elegant way. I mean, uh, uh, my viewers will know from watching um, sort of my videos, but pumping drugs out of the cell or, or chemical warfare agents out of the cell is a great way to keep yourself safe within a host. Something else that I want to look over here is the sugar pump here in deep, deep red. Um, this is also just a bit of speculation, but it looks like when the phytoplasma is in the insect, it really, really wants to make this particular sugar pump. And so this is a pump that pumps sugar into the cell. And I'm wondering if the insect environment is less sugar rich and maybe it needs to turn on another transporter to get that sugar in so that it can actually eat um, 
I think that would be, I don't know that that's true, but it's a, just a kind yeah. of a fun hypothesis. No, it totally is. Um, this is something that I, I did kind of talk, well, I don't know if I talked about it, but I, I brought it up in my, in my background research. Um, where did I put it? Uh, I'm trying to find it. I know I wrote it in here. Yeah. Um, and, and so I'll, uh, I'll just like talk a little bit about what else I'm seeing while you, uh, can go find, uh, that note that you've made. Uh, mm -hmm. hello Vino. Hello. Hello. Welcome to the stream. We're talking about. Oh, maybe I didn't pathogens. talk about it there. Okay. What I'm going to say is, um, so the re the, the cells that the phytoplasma reside in are called phloem cells. Phloem are responsible for the transport of sugar. Oh, okay. So this makes a lot of sense then. So if phloem yeah. are very sugar rich, then the phytoplasma might not need as many sugar pumps. Um, yeah. So when a, they're in the insect... Phloem, uh, so phloem, what they are is basically a straw that runs through the plant cells, like all like running through it. It's their part of their vascular system. So similar to veins. Um, what they do is they take the products of photosynthesis, so sugar <laughs> and um, signaling chemicals that come from the, the upper portions of the plant and they move them down through the plant for storage. And so being basically a straw of sap, so the sugar that these produce is, is glucose um, and when they store it, they store it as a chain, which is known as starch. Um, so this glucose form, because it hasn't been converted to starch yet while it resides in the phloem, which is where the phytoplasma resides, it's just living in that glucose-rich environment. Uh, so that it's, I, I don't really know if that's, um, so, so I, I think that that makes a very beautiful model for how or why the plant might want, uh, the phytoplasm yeah. might want to overexpress a particular sugar transporter in the insect where sugar is a lot more rare uh it's yeah. sitting a lot happier in the plant when there's a lot yeah. of sugar around and the part of the insect host that it resides in is the digestive system so it is the part of the insect that it is going to come into contact with sugars but it is not an environment where sugar is produced or stored uh, so I think this data is very compelling in the sense of like this, this matches what you would expect for a pathogen to want to do in both uh, insect and plant. One yeah. other thing that I want to point out here, and it's going to be the topic of the next couple of slides, is this thing that I've circled here, which is the mechano mechanical sensitive channel. So this is a very cool protein whose function is known. So mechanosensitive proteins regulate osmotic pressure. So this protein is capable of reacting to sensing stress. And so a mechanical stress, so stretching of the membrane. And so if you've ever taken a biology class, this is one of the first things that you learn with regards to how water affects cells. So generally cells want to be in some kind of middle ground where they are taking in water and pushing out water. If they take in too much water, they get too stretched out and could eventually burst, which would be bad. If they're not taking in enough water, they can shrivel up and die that way. And so a mechanical sensitive protein can help regulate osmotic pressure by sensing when the membrane is stretching and then helping to push out water to prevent the cell from exploding. Um, so that's the known function of this particular protein that is upregulated or more highly expressed in the plant versus the insect. And so the authors wanted to know if this protein is upregulated in the plant, if we treat it with a drug that blocks this channel, will that affect the phytoplasm growth. So this is their attempt to test their ideas. So here's what they did. They took the, um, they, uh, you know, did their whole thing where they infect uh, the leaf hoppers and then they go ahead and infect plants. After infection, there's a group of plants that are going to be fed water and another group that is going to be fed water and 
a channel inhibitor. So this is a, you can call it a poison, a poison that stops the function of this mechanical sensitive protein. So here's the thing about um, this experiment, the data from this experiment. The third week here, this is a temporary effect. So in week three, we see in red that when you stop the, the um, membrane channel activity, that you get a big inhibition of phytoplasmal growth. But by week four, that seems to normalize, which is quite interesting. Uh, and so I want to ask the chat this question. So oftentimes in science, for the general public, things are often made out to be cool because the fact themselves is cool. But as a scientist, oftentimes what I find is that untested hypotheses, so unknowns, tend to be more interesting. So I want to take a second while I catch up on chat to ask chat for hypotheses, guesses, as to why this poison only temporarily works at um, three weeks and then seems to fade in effect at week four. Now, these plants are constantly getting this poison, by the way, so it's not like they were initially getting this treatment and then they stopped. They're constantly getting this inhibitor. So I'm going to go ahead and go back to reading chat. Um, I don't know, Nep, uh, if you want to fill in uh, with some of your thoughts, but I don't. I don't want you to actually answer the question while I go ahead and catch up on what's been going on in the chat. Yeah. So one thing I just want to kind of mention when it comes to osmotic pressure in plants is this very critical function uh, we refer to as turgor pressure, and so turgor pressure is the structural ability of a plant to hold itself up and maintain its shape. Mammals, we're kind of squishy, but we use bones to structure ourselves, hold ourselves together, and, and maintain a body structure, right? You get rid of the bones, we don't really function as a moving organism anymore. Um, in plants, because they do not have structures like that, they rely on their plant cell walls, which are full of something called cellulose, and they lignify, meaning they harden and provide structural support. Um, they, in order to maintain that structural integrity, require water pressure. So it's kind of like a water balloon inside of a box. <laughs> the box will be easier to crush if it's empty, but if you put a water balloon that is filled to the, the size of the box, it's going to be a lot harder to apply that pressure and crush it from the outside. Loss of turgor pressure in plants is wilting. When you see wilting in plants, that's what's happened. There's not enough water pressure holding it together. Well, that's interesting. I always assumed there was some kind of cell lysis, like cells were... Are they... So, in wilting, are those cells still rehabilitatable? Are they still capable oh, yeah. of being pumped? Oh, interesting. So what it is, is if you see a plant wilting, you just got to add more water. It's, it's just dehydrated. Oh. The dehydration can be caused by different things. It's not always that there's not enough water. Sometimes there are infections that can cause parts of the plant to lose water in excess. Very neat. But in Phytoplasma's case, that's not really what they do. All right. So let's talk so, about yeah. hypotheses as to why this effect is temporary. And I know I talked to Nep beforehand, and we actually have very different ideas as to why this is the case. So uh, I'll go first with what I think is happening. So there's um, a concept in biology called homeostasis, and that is the ability of an organism to adapt to a challenge or a change in the environment. And so this drug that stops this pump from working, what could be happening is that the phytoplasma, the phytoplasma could be changing its um, genetic expression to make more of a different protein that compensates for this inhibition. So this is one mechanosensitive protein. Maybe in response to this poison, it is making a different 
osmolaric uh, os, um, osmolarity regulating protein. So that's my hypothesis that this drug is forcing the phytoplasma to make something else so that it can get back to doing what it needs to do. And I know Nep that your hypo hypothesis is a bit different. Uh, so what was that? Nep. Apologies. Um, my keyboard is loud, so I just mute for a moment when I'm typing. Um, could you ask me that again? Oh yeah, no problem. So, uh, what I would like to know is what your hypothesis is with regards to why this effect is temporary. So it's only, it appears that the drug only works at week three uh, and then not in week yes. four. Okay. Um, pathogens. There's a lot of them that overcome stress or um, challenges really, really fast. And so sometimes you can apply a drug and it's overcome within the generation. Uh, do you have a like mechanistic, like molecule wise kind um, of explanation or? I don't really have a molecule wise explanation, mm. but I can talk about examples in horticulture. Yeah, I think that would so, be interesting. Yeah, so perfect examples for insects, uh, specifically insects. And now I don't know if it's the same idea where it's transferred by saliva or anything. I don't know the complete mechanisms, but I can talk about control and these crops. The first one is the potato. And the potato is a host to the Colorado potato beetle, which is a devastating um, pest. And it causes something called mechanical damage not uh, piercing sucking damage their mouth parts are meant for chewing they don't suck the sap out of the plant they eat the plant tissues itself so they crawl around and eat all the leaves um what happens though is we don't have pesticides we don't have insecticides that truly work on potato beetles because of how quickly their bodies can learn to metabolize those chemicals and neutralize them yeah, I think another example is the tobacco hornworm in uh well obviously tobacco. Um in fact, sometimes the enzymes that are secreted from these insects end up being utilized in other horticultural applications because the chemicals themselves are so strong. And while I didn't do the background research on this. I can't provide sources at the moment. If people are interested, feel free to contact me. I will discuss further. So there's a comment in chat talking about evolution of the plant immune system. I think that's for a different future stream because that's also very, very fascinating as someone who is not at all familiar with uh, the immune system of plants. So actually I can talk a teeny tiny bit to that because I looked into how phloem um detects and responds to damage uh, and I think so that, that that might be a topic for i think a future stream as we're getting close to the two hour mark here we still got a couple of slides to go and i do want to save some stuff for a dedicated plant immune system uh stream so i think we'll get into that in <clears throat> a little bit uh so okay so yeah so i think it's really fascinating that this pathogen can adjust it's, um, or there's something about this pathogen that makes it so that it can adapt to the condition of this channel being shut down. Um, the other thing to note is this gene over here. Um, it's a secreted protein and the signal is super, super bright green, meaning that in the plant, the phytoplasm is making a ton of this secreted protein. And so we can actually see that with our eyes. Um, so there's this antibody that we can use, this protein that binds to this mystery protein. And we know that the genetic information that we have in earlier in the paper is validated because on the left here we have a cross section so a super super thin slice of the plant uh, and then on this side we have a super super thin slice of the insect and we can see in blue that expression of the 
mystery protein is only in the phloem in the plant. So up here, A and B not infected, C and D infected. We only see blue in panel C, which refers to the plant. And not only is it only in the plant, but it's only in the plant phloem. So this agrees quite well with what we know about uh, um, phytoplasma to begin with, is that they do hang out in the phloem. And there's an incredible amount of this protein, as we see, saw earlier from the genetic expression experiments. And what's exciting to me is that we don't know what this does. Um, <laughs> that's probably for some PhD student out there to figure out. Uh, but I think once they find out why this bug, need, why this pathogen needs to make so much of this protein, something that could be in the future in terms of um, treatment for this disease is crafting a genetic treatment that shuts this protein down and maybe that would be a good way to treat this pathogen um, and so to talk a little more about this pathogen's niche in the phloem we have this slide where we uh where nep can talk about uh, the structure of phloem which i think is kind of interesting okay so the structure of phloem and i guess this is this i can tie a little bit into the how the phloem repairs itself. Um, so phloem is a part of the vascular system of plants. I did not include the full vascular system. That's all plant structure junk. We don't need to go that far into it. Um, phloem is kind of like a straw that moves sugars from top of the plant to bottom of the plant. That's how it goes. Um, it is comprised of a couple different types of cells, and they are both, they're all fairly unique. Um, so this diagram is missing one form of the cells, which are called a parenchyma cell. A parenchyma cell is a storage cell. Um, something fairly common in plant cells, <clears throat> although not common in animal cells is a feature called the central vacuole or vacuoles um, and they're just storage spaces within a cell. This kind of cell, the parenchyma one, is fully just meant for this storage purpose. It has the other components but it is largely vacuole space. There are also companion cells that are, um, they go along with the sieve tube element which is another cell type, um, but the companion cell is more or less a normal looking cell. The sieve tube element is very unique in structure. Um, the complementary tube system of the plant is called the xylem and it's water transport. So water from the roots go up, sugars from the leaves go down and flow. Um, xylem are tubes comprised of dead cells Phloem are tubes comprised of living cells. So even structurally, they're quite different. Um, they, they function very differently. These sieve tubes are divided by something called a sieve plate. And this sieve plate is kind of like a strainer. And so uh, one thing that I came across was there is uh, differences in sizing between these holes in the sieve plate and the size of phytoplasmas. Phytoplasmas are significantly smaller than these pores, meaning they can readily move through the phloem channels. Um, so if they get into one cell, it's very, very easy for them to flow right through to another cell without actually having to go through membranes. Um, so, uh, what else can I ask a little bit I, about yeah. what the role of the companion cell is? Yes. So this is fascinating. When a phloem cell starts, before it's really differentiated, it has, you know, the components of a cell, a nucleus, maybe some like reticulated, uh, so what do you call it? Endo, endoplasmic reticulum? Endoplasmic reticulum, yep that thing uh golgi apparatus uh bolt yeah golgi bodies um mitochondria all of those things the companion cell 
as it develops and differentiates and becomes the companion cell, contains those things. It can provide the elements it needs to survive. Whoa, see- okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, so this is, this is kind of mind-breaking to me, too. You describe Phloem as being alive, but in reality, they're... You could describe them as parasitic to the companion cell, then, because they've essentially given all of the things to the companion cell, and the companion cell sort of keeps the phloem alive. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes. So I actually provided a little bit of <clears throat> this in my discussion, and you asked for context. So this is the context now. <laughs> okay. um, the sieve tube element has lost a bunch of these organelles. It cannot produce these elements. It is very similar to the phytoplasma in that it can't produce the things it needs to survive as a living cell. The companion cell does, and it provides it to the sieve tube elements. That's so, that's so freaking cool. <laughs> now, one thing that I wanted to talk about here is, and where did I put this? Since companion cells are the supplier of the majority of the materials not synthesized by phytoplasmas, the ones that are indicated in our paper, do they have a preference to what kind of phloem cell they reside in? The paper doesn't describe the type of phloem cell they've pulled this RNA from. The discovery of phytoplasmas was in sieve tube elements, but this paper doesn't discuss which cells they took it from or if they differentiated the cell types. Gotcha. So So I don't know. In this sort of like what phloem, you are referring to whether or not the phytoplasm were in the companion cell, the C or the sieve tube. Yes. And the reasoning behind I want, like why I think this is information that we should know is companion cells, they produce the majority of the materials needed by the sieve elements and the phytoplasma. But because the sieve elements are the transport pathway for sap and sugars, which environment is more preferential to a phytoplasma? Yeah, that's actually really interesting. And I I didn't even have the like knowledge to ask that question. My guess is that the parasite would likely prefer to be in a companion cell because that's just where all the stuff is. Um, but I don't actually know that for a fact. That's I kind want of interesting to, to think about. Combat that with the structural component that the sieve tube element is full of pores and transit between the cells is um, there is no. It's it's completely passive. Uh, so they can move through multiple sieve element cells with no energy output because they're just floating through the current of it. Gotcha. So they don't even need to swim. Maybe they've jettisoned their uh, <laughs> genes right? for things like motor so proteins as well or, or, or flagella or stuff like that. more preferential? Or are they found equally throughout both? Yeah, Who that's knows? really interesting. I don't know. That's cool. Right? So that's anyways, cool. that's one direction my brain took the info saying this is something that could use more research and understanding to be applied to their goals. All right. So we've actually come to this summary, I believe. Believe it or not, we are at the end of this paper. Um, so to summarize kind of like why we picked this paper and why it's cool is that there are these teeny tiny bacteria that live in both plants and insects. They have such a reduced genome that they're candidates for the minimum unit of life even. And what's amazing about these organisms is that despite having such a small genome that's jettisoned a lot of stuff that we used to think were essential for life, they're actually capable of living in two highly, highly different environments, one being in plants and one being in insects. So not only do they have like very little in their genome, but they're actually capable of switching what little they have depending on the context that they find themselves in. This was a pretty exploratory paper with regards to just identifying which genes are on and which genes are off in their context. So not a lot was seriously... uh 
discovered seriously being like there's not a lot that is directly translatable to a treatment for phytoplasma but it sets a beautiful groundwork by which researchers can pick apart the structure and function of these proteins that these genes uh, actually make and so one of these proteins is the mechanosensitive protein which is a protein that senses the stretch and strain of a cellular membrane and responds in turn by helping the protein uh, helping the cell uh, maintain correct osmotic pressure and what they found was that when they used a drug that stopped this pump from working at the phytoplasma were not as likely or not as able to grow proving a concept by which if you target the genes that are specific for the plant in the phytoplasma that you might be able to prevent that phytoplasma from growing the other so big something yeah i haven't talked about at all i just didn't mention it because trying to limit how much i was doing um so i don't again didn't research this in full detail but um the the protein the chemical that causes this in plants are known as auxins mm. and so auxins are um the cause and they're responsible for things like um photosensitivity like when sunflowers will move throughout the day to follow the sun and they're also responsible for that stretching the etiolation that can occur and so what i'm wondering <laughs> is this mystery protein is it related directly to auxins are auxins, I didn't look into it, but I would, I would be interested in knowing because auxins function by moving shit around the cell to increase uh, the, the, like, what do you call it? To cause the stretching. So they do slightly different things and move stuff around in a cell. Gotcha. The mystery protein is one that is secreted, so... Uh, it just makes me wonder if it, if it acts related, on Related, Gotcha, gotcha. That, right? So for further discussion, if, if we wanted to look into it, we might want to look into its impact in regards to auxin. Yeah, that would be kind of cool. Uh, okay, so there are a couple of lingering questions that I think we have the space and time to discuss, some of which have come out of NEP's Discord. So um, one question that was brought up was, does plant disease, the symptoms of these disease, conferred evolutionary benefit to phytoplasma? So for context, the most uh, you know successful pathogens, quote-unquote pathogens, the most successful microorganisms that exist in your body are your microbiome, right? The healthy bacteria that exist in your gut, they formed a friendship with your immune system. Uh, and as long as you live, they'll be able to uh, pass on their genetic material. So it's not in a microorganism's best interest to actually cause disease with a few notable exceptions. You know, so the bacteria that do cause disease Part of how they evolved to do that is by uh, spreading in the form of like coughing or sneezing, you know, they've evolved to be contagious and that's the strategy that then they adapted to pass on their genetic information. The question that I didn't even think about uh, is, you know, there are pathogens that evolve to make us sneeze so that they can pass on and, and be spread from host to host. I have no idea how turning a flower into a leaf or how making a leaf kind of green or or uh causing this abnormal branching helps the pathogen it doesn't have to that's the thing about evolution is that it doesn't always have to make 100 percent sense all the time but i'm wondering if these symptoms do help the pathogen in some kind of way i don't know Nep, if yeah, you want to take a stab at I... that yeah I loved this. So last night I was up late working on my background research and I decided to do it in my voice chat um, just to kind of, you know, body doubling. Um, and one of my uh, community members asked the question, why? Why does it turn into a leaf? What's the purpose? And I went, oh, well, I can explain that. I didn't even think of it. So here we go. So. The symptoms of phyllidae and fluorescence that 
floral structure becoming leaf-like structures, turning green, becoming additional photosynthetic tissue. What it does is inadvertently leads to the production of more sugar. More, photosynth more photosynthesis causes more green. Uh, oh no, sorry. More photosynthesis is because of more green. More photosynthesis causes more food for the bug and for the phytoplasma. So by producing additional photosynthetic tissue, extra leaves instead of floral structures, the vescents, meaning uh, tissues that aren't usually green, becoming green and being photosynthetic, um, it, it causes food. It increases food. Yeah, and I think that's a particularly elegant explanation in terms of like I had I hadn't considered that uh, photosynthesis, you know, forcing a more leaf-like uh, phenotype would be beneficial for the pathogen by means of just giving it more food. I'm wondering if you could test this by, mm, I don't know, like a, a glucose dye or something to check, or rather, I guess. So here's how I would test that theory experimentally. I don't know if this would work in a plant, but what you could do is you take an infected uh an infected plant and you add in hormones that force the production of a flower like structure i don't know if those exist they but do it would, it would be oh that's cool. okay so so maybe this would work so it would be interesting to see if if you forced the plant to make a flower after it's been infected does that prevent the phytoplasma from growing or does it slow them from growing that'd be a pretty good way to test whether or not your hypothesis is true um i'd be very curious to see if that ends up being right i assume no because what it is is it changes the gene expression and it changes the differentiation pathway of the stem cell Right. So so if the phytoplasm is forcing it to become a leaf, and if we add chemicals that'll force it to become a flower, would that interfere with the phytoplasma's growth is, is sort of my idea. Um, flowering is not just one chemical. Gotcha. So it's, it's a whole it's series of environmental inputs as well. If you want to induce flowering in different plants, you actually largely do it through light conditions and a little bit with nutritional um, inputs. Gotcha. So it's so not something that you can force. So if you increase certain minerals, certain nutrients, um, the plant will have more of the things required for flowering. And... Um, Flowering, there's two groups of how flowering occurs. There's short day plants and long day plants. And this is where the enzymes are produced um, to cause, like to in instigate the flowering. Um, but what instigates the flowering is triggered by light. Gotcha. So it's kind of like setting up the conditions that enable a plant to be, to to flower instead of like a chemical that forces it to become a flower. Yeah, yeah that would so be kind of messy. Horticultural application, it's just not really possible. For example, poinsettias. Poinsettias are a horticulturally um, really important crop. We think about them at Christmas and how many of them you see around you. Um, poinsettias, in order for these plant structures to turn red, so this is similar to vivescence, but instead of turning green, they turn red, um, it is light dependent. And it actually takes about 13 weeks of very specific light conditions in order for this color phenomenon to take place. If it's interrupted, this, the whole thing doesn't work. I see. So it's it's it. Mm, so it, it it would be messy to do this kind of experiment. Um, you would need not only a greenhouse environment, but a greenhouse environment that can have adequate light control. Meaning you cannot rely or really utilize light from the sun because it will not match the conditions required for triggering the flowers. It's applicable in research because there are things called growth chambers. And you can use those to mimic perfect 
conditions, but you the cost to run these things is really only applicable for research. Gotcha. Uh, then probably leave it up to the researchers then. <laughs> so the next question um, that I think is kind of interesting to ponder is that, so phytoplasma have all these different genes that are upregulated in the plant and it causes disease in the plant, but you know, as far as I know, they don't really cause disease in insects. So whether or not, you know, I don't really know if the insect cares that it's been infected by phytoplasma, but it'd be interesting to tease apart why this um, existence of the phytoplasma in the insect doesn't trigger some kind of heavy-handed immune response. Um, uh, that'd well, be interesting to know. I think the reason we don't have any info to like discuss on this is at the moment, phytoplasma research has really just been in plants. And they really haven't done the same kind of research into the function in the insect. And so there's just not as much information available at the moment. So I think, you know, going down the line a couple years, we may have the answer to this. But for now, it's just a really good question to hypothesize on. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm being presumptive. I don't actually know if it causes disease in insects. So, so that, well, that is me making an assumption. Well, the paper said um, it, in most insect hosts, it does not cause negative uh, or like um, paras uh, uh, doesn't cause bad, oh, sorry, words. But it, it did say that it can in some insect cases, although I don't have a reference available or rather, I don't have, I didn't review the reference available to talk about those. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah but yeah. most of these hosts, they experience no negative symptoms. It'd be cool to do a follow-up on this, uh, be mm -hmm. more modern research, because this paper is from quite a while ago. Uh, so... <laughs> they talk so, don't judge me. <laughs> I swear I'm educated. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the, the other question that I have, and this is something that I, I don't even know how I would go about understanding this, is how does phytoplasma act at the interface of species? So we know that, you know, there are these upregulated genes when it's inside the insect, and we know that there are upregulated genes inside the plant, but there's got to be a transition point between the leaf, hop, the, the, the leaf hopper and the plant. And I mm -hmm. bet that that expression profile is going to be pretty interesting too, whether or not it needs to make specific proteins to survive that transition, uh, I think is also a worthwhile thing to study, although I have no idea how you would do that. This, this ties into the, the plant's response, defense response. Um, and so I don't know on the, ink, like on the phytoplasma end, of the the de like the mechanisms that are taking place but in the plant um evolutionarily the plant has evolved to be able to detect insect saliva so saliva can be detected by plants and systemic responses take place very quickly following um within the plant, it triggers defense mechanisms to seal off damaged cells. In the phloem, the short-term response is to plug the cell, doing something similar to platelet function, but with sap and sap proteins. Long-term, it looks to provide structural repair to seal it off permanently. So given that there is such a unique chemical environment at the interface of insect and plant, uh, that almost kind of demands a pretty interesting, unique expression profile from the phytoplasma. It'd be interesting to know whether or not that interplay between the mm -hmm. immune system of the plant and the uh, offending bug causes some kind of different change in the phytoplasma. Although, again, uh, I'm not familiar enough with the biology to figure out oh. how to investigate that. The only other note to make on that is that this kind of interaction is also being studied in regards to mechanical chewing damage on plants and the, um, the pheromones that actually get secreted or potentially um, moved through root systems via mycorrhizae um, to other plants. Because some things that have been discovered is that when 
a plant nearby is damaged, other plants receive signals that cause them to begin preventative defense. So this is an area of research, although it's not studied in regards to phytoplasmas at the moment, it is studied in regards to pheromones and preventative defense mechanisms. Yeah, uh, I think that um, I, I would love to look into a little more about how, because the thing about like plants in terms of reading about them that I'm realizing is that they are, you know, unlike us with um, soft mammalian cells uh, or, or animal cells, wet, soft cells that make up our circulatory system with dedicated uh, circulating immune cells like yours truly, plants often rely a lot heavier on chemical signaling uh, as opposed to the work of individual cells, which I find to be pretty interesting. They are quite mm -hmm. chemically reactive, which I guess should really surprise us because a lot of why we cultivate plants is for the chemicals that we can get from them. I would say that it's kind of their language. That's how they share information. Yeah, yeah, that's really a uh, pretty, pretty elegant system with the, it's in the environment. And there's mm -hmm. this last question. So this one's basically, Nep, this is your question, and I'm going to leave it to you to explain because I don't really have the context for this. So please take, to, uh, so please go ahead. Yes, okay. Um, so this comes down to ornamentals, and this is a fun thing because we're moving from food crop discussion and the importance I guess we didn't really go into it. Anyways, if you have flowers that turn into leaves, you don't get fruit. So your crop yield is, again, pardon my language, but your crop real yield is screwed. Like you lose so much profit as a result. You put all the input in, but you get nowhere near the output. Anyways, with uh, landscaping and ornamentals, I am curious to know if there would be horticulturally um, useful applications for vivescence that's caused by phytoplasmas. Not necessarily the phyllidy where it turns into a leaf-like structure, but maintaining the green, uh, maintaining the floral structures, but the greening of the floral structures. So instead of petals being white or perhaps um, a traditional color for them, they would be green in color. So just increased chloroplast, um, chlorophyll in the cell. This makes things more tolerant to shade conditions. Because of the increased photosynthetic tissues during flowering, when a plant flowers, it switches its goals from growth to reproduction. And so it pushes more of its energy towards the reproductive organs than it does the um, non-reproductive tissues. I, I keep forgetting what you would call those. Anyways, um, if these tissues that it's pushing its energy into are also photosynthetic, the plant has more food available during flowering, which is beneficial if they're living in shady conditions. The reason I want to know if this is useful for landscape purposes is can we utilize this to make more plant breeds shade tolerant? I'm can also... you breed plants to show this in the plant? So more likely to host this strain without damage to cause the greening yeah, it'd be interesting to see yeah. if we could genetically engineer a phytoplasma that doesn't cause the horrible disease, but rather just this mm -hmm. fun pigment effect. Um, yeah, and so, like, this pigment effect does exist in nature. There are plants that do this. Hydrangeas are a really good example. Many hydrangeas are actually kind of green-colored when they bloom. Um, and those ones are actually fairly shade-tolerant, which is, you know, fascinating. Um, that being said, uh, there is also this wonderful video game example from Animal Crossing. In Animal Crossing, these little chrysanthemums, you can breed and crossbreed them to get green ones. 
and the green ones would technically be caused by the vessels. Yeah, I also am wondering whether or not there's a trade-off. Um, obviously, if... Well, actually, I don't know if it's obvious, but presumably the color pigment of the flowers is there for pollinators to be attracted to. I'm wondering if this is a technique that might be more useful for when we can like artificially i don't even know if we can artificially pollinate plants i'm so like not plant smart <laughs> but i'm wondering if if you made the flower petals green if pollinators would stop being attracted to them that's kind of interesting so that would be interesting um but if we're going for landscape purposes it's really not as big of a concern that's true if you're if you're just um, talking about a lot maintaining of landscape. landscaped variety like a lot of really common varieties for landscaping aren't even produced by seed they're just clones yeah, actually, I mean, you bring up a good point. Then my next concern would be whether or not this... My concern would be whether or not a genetically engineered organism like this would be... have the potential to be uh, invasive. Be genetically in engineered? I think what you would do is you would find a strain of the phytoplasma that only expresses vivescence, and once you've cultured it in some of this plant you want to express the greening in, you just start cloning that plant. So the phytoplasma continues to be reproduced through the clones. And I'm wondering if uh, they'll get like a competitive advantage over their naturally colored peers. Right? And that would be what makes them shade tolerant. And that would be why you would apply them for shade landscaping. Yeah, that, that's a pretty interesting idea. I wonder, yeah, I wonder if people are doing that. It's pretty nuts. Um, right? At the moment, I don't think so, but it's cool. It's a good idea. So that's kind of... <laughs> we do manipulate colors in other plants for nutritional aspects. Golden rice is a good example where we increase the carotenoid production to because that's your uh, vitamin A? Vitamin K. It's vitamin K. Uh, I don't particularly remember. <laughs> But we what already do that vitamins. to manipulate nutritional ele elements of foods. Yeah, so I, I think, so that's basically, I think where we'll end with a paper, uh, and then we'll have a little time to just chat and, and, and answer any questions that we might have uh, for those of you who are still in chat about uh, plant pathogens, pathogens in general, like we're free now just for a bit to uh, talk about overall impressions. I guess the other thing while we wait for questions is just kind of talking about mm, our experience reading the paper. That might be kind of interesting to do. Uh, so I had picked this paper specifically because it was uh, open access. Uh, basically, it means that I can show all of these figures and still monetize it as long as I give credit. Um, which is nice because I would like to retain the like five cents that I'm going to make for this stream. Um, but also like, since that was my main criteria, I didn't really have stricter requirements for this thing. Um, and reading into this paper, I found myself to be both uncomfortable and comfortable with different parts of the experience. Comfortable in the sense where, you know, it's talking about molecular biology techniques that I'm very well familiar with. But then I, felt like my understanding of the impact of this paper was quite shallow because I didn't have any of the background required to actually understand, you know, what these plants are. And so I want to ask Nep what your uh, kind of head state or, or emotional state uh, was reading this paper, which is, I think, more in my genre than in yours in terms of the bulk of the text. At least that's how I feel. What's kind of funny is I feel exactly the same in regards to, I feel like I have so much context into what's going on here that I didn't really struggle to understand what was going on. Gotcha. So I think so most of this clicked for me in terms of why the research was done, applications of future research, um, economic importance of the research, like why the location of the research makes sense. Like, that kind of stuff made a lot of contextual sense to me because this, this kind of is what I studied in school. Um, I happen to be really into entomology, so anytime I had freedom to pick my, my specific subject, I would always tie it back to bugs. Um, <laughs> so I've done a lot of 
undergraduate level research on plant insect relations. Um, what was I going to say in regards to that? Yes, this paper scratched an itch in my brain that I didn't remember, like I didn't realize I needed. <laughs> um, and I guess, well, I don't know the ins and outs of the experiment processes. The paper itself is fascinating from an applied plant science standpoint. Um, I would also like to explain the reason this gets me so interested versus a botanist is that horticulture is specifically the, the management for production of these kinds of plants. Whereas a botanist is more along the lines of the science behind the plant. So more like what Phi does in terms of cell biology, but plant cells. Thank you for outlining the difference because these are terms that I never like properly defined within my own head, you know, horticulture versus agriculture yeah, versus it's, botany. It's a very nebulous term. Horticulture has so many things underneath it. I think often plant science, the whole umbrella, is misunderstood. When we think of animal sciences, we have things like medicine veterinary medicine, um, pharmacy, we have um, kinesiology, we have, you know, like we have all of these really specified branches that we're all aware of. All of these branches exist as separate areas of study for plants. So I think that's a pretty fascinating look into, because um, like the last thing that I learned about plants uh it was a carbon fixating enzyme called rubisco back in graduate school mm. but it was just a very Rubisco's small part so cool uh yeah uh rubisco collab at some point perhaps because i do think <laughs> that because if because like in terms of where this kind of research overlaps for me in particular is this idea of carbon fixation and the engineering of cells to do things that we want including things like slow down climate change that would you know <laughs> carbon capture the discovery that of rubisco is really important to plant science and agriculture so i would love to cover that as a topic with you yeah uh so so i think that would be another potential there's, like there's so much overlap and i'm learning uh, learning a lot about plants in a way that like Mm, I w I wouldn't have encountered naturally, let's say, in my in my career path. So it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on, Nep. Is there anything else that you would like to say to the audience before we go ahead and call this a freaking stream? I'm gonna info dump one more thing. Yeah, go ahead. Phytoplasmas are not transmitted from parent to progeny because vascular tissues like phloem do not exist in seed tissues. So they are uh, distinct in terms of their compartments. So the type of uh, cell required for the phytoplasma does not exist in a seed. Well, that's interesting. So a seed is perhaps uh, not permissive of the pathogen, which is kind of cool. Yeah. So I, uh, where did I write it? God damn it. I wrote it here too. Yeah, the context of infection also highly, highly matters. I can imagine that if you are a, uh, if if we're talking about, you know, if we go back to the phloem oh, slide in yeah, terms here. of the structure of phloem. <clears throat> so seeds, they don't contain vascular tissues. That vascular bundle containing xylem, cambium, and phloem, they don't have those. They rely on symplastic and apoplastic diffusion between the cells and within the cells, like across membranes and traveling in the spaces between cells. After embryogenesis, so once the embryo imbibes water and begins germination, these tissues will begin forming. So that is why phytoplasma cannot be passed from parent to progeny and require the insect host. 
So MegaCraft has a great question, and I'm going to try to answer this because I want to see if I remember plant biology correctly. So the question is, if that's the case, how does the plant grow the seeds? So if the seeds are cut off from the phloem, mm -hmm. then how does the seed grow? So from my understanding, the seed already has all of the components required so it comes stored with the high amount of uh nutrition and supportive uh hormones and all that already within as it is formed so once that seed has been formed uh then it is already kind of a complete thing on its own so in terms of like this structural distinctiveness i think where we're getting at is um the tissue type of the seed might not be permissible so it's might not it might not necessarily be that there's not a connection but it's that like the actual biology of the seed itself does not allow for phytoplasm proliferation uh how does that sound to you nip be why it has the two stage life cycle and different hosts needing something to survive in when the plant dies requires an alternate host. Somewhere else it can exist in the meantime. Phytoplasmas require some real specific conditions to survive. So it's not going to survive in the soil. It's not going to survive in dead plant tissue. It needs living tissues to live in. It's adapted itself to bug guts. Yeah, bug guts and living phloem. Uh, just, uh, it might be just the, those two cases. The thing that I think is and the most important takeaway from this piece of discussion is not so much what a seed structurally is, but rather in an ecological standpoint, if the phytoplasma and the infections became so common within the host populations that the host populations could not reproduce enough, it would be the downfall of their populations. It would be like any other interaction between predator and prey. Eventually, the prey population gets small, the predator population dies off. It's a cycle. Yeah, uh, and I think that's quite a good note to end on in terms of like, you know, if we all wrap around back to evolutionary theory, you know. Yeah, they, they do play a role in the environment. Whether or not it's a role that benefits us is irrelevant. Yeah, like, and I, I think that gets into... They're still going to do their thing. Sort of the, the overarching theme of evolution, of ev uh, survival of the fittest, doesn't necessarily <clears throat> mean physically fit, but rather fit as in there's a niche that has a specific shape, and yeah, it would be the good ability to, fit to survive in, there. in their niche. The ability to literally physically fit inside of a, a niche uh, is what fit is referring to, not necessarily how big your muscles are. Okay, with mm -hmm. that being said, Nep, do you have anything to plug before I end the stream? Um, if you like arts and crafts, I do a lot of those on my channel, not just garden talk. So, I yeah. Yeah, and Nep's channel is pinned in the chat. I do have one thing to plug, which is my Archaea video, which I have been working very diligently on. I should be able to get it out at some point next week. Uh, I'm very excited for you to all see this long-form video of mine. It actually shares some similar characteristics with Phytoplasma, which I was very excited to see in terms of the general mystery behind Archaea. Um, all right. Oh, hey, Faye. Uh, Hey. Thank you. We are having a great stream. I've learned a lot about plants today. Uh, Faye, do you want to plug yourself? Faye is another one of uh, STEM tuber, science VTubers who who do educational content here on uh, YouTube. Uh, That's going to be yeah. exciting. I'll have to drop a follow. Yeah. <laughs> or a sub. Sorry. <laughs> Twitch terms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're trying to bridge uh, Twitch and YouTube. So so Nep is on Twitch and I'm on, I'm on YouTube. But Faye is a fellow YouTube streamer who's doing similar things um yeah but you've actually come at like uh, the end of the stream so we're actually going to go and sign off now but thank you all for watching i hope you've learned a thing or two about plants and their pathogens i know i have and i will see you in the uh Archaea video, which is coming up. Uh, and also, there's no stream next week. I will be away, but hopefully, you'll have a video to tie you down. All right. Thank you all for coming.
Bye. Hey, Saturday. Bye.